You know, um, Father's Day is like a lot of holidays. For some of us, Father's Day or Christmas or whatever brings up these wonderful images. And so for some of us, like Father's Day is just awesome because you had an awesome dad. Well, and for some of us, and I consider myself among the some of us who didn't have a very positive experience with their dads, Father's Day can be really, really tough. And, and so I've got a couple of objectives. One is I want to help those get over the hurt of experiencing a difficult father, and I want to help us who are fathers become better fathers but at the end of the day, though, this message is about how the great father can transform us into people of unimaginable love and kindness. Um, about 15 years ago, I, I had this breakthrough with my dad. Now, I'm 45, I know that shocks you. <laughs> by the way, by the way, so my son did really, really well on his final exams for ninth grade, so I rewarded him. We went to Foot Locker. We, we bought him these shoes, and uh, we struck up a conversation with the young lady who was helping us get the shoes, and I explained to her, yeah, I was a former professional athlete. I played football for the Carolina Panthers, Indianapolis Colts, and she goes, you mean you still don't play? And I, and I looked at my son, and both of us were like, So, uh, about 15 years ago, um, I, I had this breakthrough with my dad that my anger towards him turned into, com into compassion. And it was like God sucked the venom of bitterness out of my heart. By the way, being bitter at someone is like drinking poison and hoping that the person you're mad at dies. But it's us who actually, who actually die. And, and so, um, God's rearranged my heart and my affections towards my dad. And I didn't know why I liked the color yellow for so long, like this yellow watch here. It, 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 yellow has always been my favorite color, but I didn't own anything yellow. Well, now that I can look back on my sixth birthday, one of my last moments where my dad was involved with my life, he bought me a yellow bike. So all these years, I like yellow and don't own nothing yellow. So this yellow watch is a reminder of God's healing grace. It's a reminder of how God can take something that's a scar and turn it into a memorial of his, of his healing. So here's the reality for us humans, is none of us are gonna have a perfect dad no matter how good he was. And for those of us who are dads or one day will be a dad, you're not gonna be a perfect dad. However, there is a perfect father who loves us with a love that is unimaginable, who comforts us and strengthens us. As a matter of fact, he's a father that many of us may not have ever known. So this Father's Day, will you worship the faithful and perfect father? This Father's Day, will you worship the faithful and perfect father? Will you worship him? Now, worship doesn't just mean music, and you guys have wonderful music teams. That's a part of worshiping, but, but worship at its deepest essence is, is, Father, I need you. This is really gonna shock you, but my daughter just turned 20. Hello. And so, I remember when she was really young, and, and she would run up to, to me. Parents, you remember when your kids are young and, and they kind of walk like Frankenstein towards you? And I remember she would walk up to me like that, and she'd lift her hands, and she would go, Papi. Now, I'm not Puerto Rican, so I don't know where that came from. But, <laughs> but she, would, she would call me Papi. And I would go, ah, mija, and then I, I just, I would just. <laughs> I, and, and I would pick her up and hold her, right? So you know what worship is? Worship is you and I walking like Frankenstein to God the Father and saying, Poppy, would you hold me? Poppy, I need you. That's what worship is. Worship is saying, God, I need you. Just the way my lungs need my next breath, I need you more. We're gonna look at Ephesians chapter three, verses 14 through 21. 
Now, for those of you who were like I was before I came to know Jesus about 18 years ago, I had no clue what Ephesians was. I would have thought that that was something that you put hydrocortisone on, you know. Uh, but Ephesians <laughs> is a book, <laughs> that imagery, like Ephesians, yes. It's the Ephesians is gone. Um, Ephesians was written by a man by the name of Paul. He at one time hated Jesus and his church, but Jesus rescued him, transformed him, and he's writing to these group of people, these small churches in Ephesus, which is modern day Turkey, right? And so he's writing to them about God's love, and it reads this way. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit and your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Verse 20. Now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is worked within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. In 2001, I was in my study and I had become a Christian about four years earlier through a teammate with the Colts. Literally for five years, he chased me around the locker room half naked with a towel around, wrapped, seriously, with a towel wrapped around his, babe, his, his, his waist and his Bible uh, sharing the gospel with, with, with me. Eventually, the love of God penetrated my heart, transformed me. And so in 2001, I'm writing these letters to family and friends and I'm like, Jesus is great. Jesus will forgive you. He's awesome. And then I heard a voice. Now I'm not saying it's God's voice. I just heard a voice, I'm in the room by myself, and the voice says, find your father. I stood up in my office and started cussing. I won't do that now. I started cussing. I am not gonna find him. Where was he when I needed to learn how to treat women as a teenage boy. Where was he when I needed him? He didn't come to none of my games in middle school and high school and college. Why should I find him? He doesn't deserve me finding him. Besides, I'm fine. I'm talking in a room with no one in there yelling and cursing. I was not fine. <laughs> so I was kind of having a spiritual tantrum. You know how kids do in Target down a toy aisle? They're like, Mama, I need that one. And you're like, well, Johnny, you already have that one. He's like, I need another one, right? And he's on the ground crying. Anyway, so it's like I'm on the ground crying. And it wasn't like God was like, get up. It, it was like God just gently scooped me up, put me on his lap and, and, and grabbed my head and put it near his heartbeat so I could hear the rhythm of grace and the way he feels about my dad. Because the closer we are to God's heart, the closer we will be to loving people because that's what God does. So it was like God saying, Derwin, I know what it's like to be rejected because my son Jesus is rejected all the time. Derwin, I know what it's like to be abandoned because my son Jesus was abandoned by his closest friends. Derwin, will never forget this. You said your father doesn't deserve you going to find him well, you didn't deserve my son Jesus going to find you. You see, I forgave you so you could forgive him. And eventually, I wrote him a letter, found out he was in prison, and is our relationship perfect? It's not, but man, it's so much better than what it is. So much better than what it is. So, so this Father's Day, will you let God the Father love you with his regenerating love? Would, would, would you let God the Father love you with his regenerating love? His regenerating love. And by the way, that is a big theological word. But, but like I say at Transformation Church, you know, I always say we're not afraid of big theological words. And here's why. This is really deep. You may want to write this down. Okay, you ready? This is deep. I mean, 
I got a doctorate for this stuff. We're not afraid of big words because I explained them. <laughs> the word regeneration means this. It, it means that not only when we receive Jesus as our God and our Savior and our friend, it literally means that God shares his life with us. It literally means that God allows us to participate in his eternal kind of life. It literally means that God says, I'm gonna come and live in you. I'm gonna make you alive with my life. So not only does God love us, but he loves us with a love that gives us his eternal kind of life. Check this out. Ephesians 3, 16. And I love this. 2,000 years ago, Paul says, I pray. He's praying for you and me. This Jewish man, 2,000 years ago, is praying for you and me. God inspired him to do that. Listen, he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you. Let's pause here. Why does he need to strengthen us? Because you and I are weak. I know some of you guys are like, okay, is this the football dude who played in the NFL and he's talking about being weak? Yeah. The more I learn, the more God accomplishes this through me, the more I realize how weak and fragile I am. At 45, I'm learning that I'm pretty much busted up, toe up from the flow up. Um, that's Hebrew. <laughs> Not Hebrew, Hebro. What busted up talk from the flow up means is this. I realize that in a world like ours, I need to understand how weak I am because in my weakness, I'm stronger than I can ever be because my strength is not found in me. My strength is found in the one who is eternally strong. So if you're weak here today, I got good news for you. God wants to strengthen you in your inner being. And you know what he wants to do? He wants to strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Now watch this. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. A a a teenagers and preteens and young adults, whatever campus you are, wherever you are around the world, whatever, right? Think about this. The Jewish Messiah, Jesus, the eternal son of God, could have chosen to live anywhere, and he goes, I want to live in you. He's like, I want you to be my spiritual condominium. I want to live in you. Jesus could have chosen to live anywhere, and he goes, I want to live in you. So you know what that means, and I know what you're thinking. You're going, well, I'm not worthy, and he goes, I know. That's why I went to the cross. That's why I rose from the dead, to make you worthy. You go, but I don't deserve that, and he goes, I know you don't. That's why I'm giving you grace. How valuable must you be to God if God says, I'm going to deposit the greatest treasure in heaven, the glorious riches of Christ Jesus, to live in you? Then he says, I pray that you being rooted and established in love. I love that imagery, rooted. So you know what would be cool? If somebody wrote a book with a big old tree and deep roots. Matter of fact, I think I'm going to do that. What beautiful imagery. The deeper your roots are in God's love, the bigger and stronger your tree is going to be, and the more beautiful life giving fruit will be produced. Would you let the Father's love root you in Himself through Christ? Now, why does God need to make us alive? Yeah, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. He says, as for you, that's speaking to you and me, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So all of us are born spiritually dead. That's why people in the South, they go, brother, are you born again? You know, do y'all do that out here on the West Coast? You guys, you guys be like, hey, dude, totally, man. Are you born again? No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but here's the point. We're all born spiritually dead. Here's an illustration. So I'm on Instagram the other day. If you don't know what that is, talk to somebody 18 and younger. So I'm on Instagram, 
and there's this video of three babies. They may be, I don't know, two years old, 18 months, two and a half, I don't know. But one of them has a popsicle, and he's just eating it. He's in his diaper. You know, they chunky and rolly. It's awesome. He, he's, he's eating it, and he takes it out of his mouth, and he does like this to the other baby, and the other baby's like, Ugh. and then he just moves it. Then he eats it again. He keeps doing it over and over and over again. And this poor baby just hadn't figured it out after like 20 times. Just, uh, uh. Who taught that baby to do that? Or, or for those of you who've had kids, how is it that the first words they learn really good are no and mine? Like, think about it as parents. Do we ever tell our babies no? Or do we go, little baby, this house is mine. How do they learn that? And it doesn't stop. Now, teenagers, trust me on this one, okay? Pastor D. Gray, I'm for you. Put this in your pocket, because you're gonna need it one day. Parents, am I right about, about this? Your kids are in high school, after school, after practice, whatever. You go to in and out and you buy them some burger and fries. And then you have the audacity to ask them for a French fry. <laughs> Not French fries, French fry. I'm talking about uno, uh, one. And you go, hey, can I have a French fry? And they go, you want a French fry? No. I look at my kids and I go, I just bought it for you. I'm like, you don't even pay rent at the house. The clothes you got, I bought. The DNA you have, it's mine. Give me a French fry. I just want a fry. Can a brother have a fry? <laughs> now, some of you teenagers are like, yeah, that's true, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> so here's the point. Why is it it's a virtue to go from being selfish to selfless? That's a small picture of this condition we have that we need to be made alive. Look what Paul says in the rest of the verse. He says, like the rest, we were by nature deserving wrath. In other words, we were separated from God. We were spiritually dead. But look at verse four. I love verse four. You know why? Because it starts with the word but. God has big butts and he cannot lie. <laughs> Satan will try to deny. Watch this, but because of his great love for us. Let me pause here. Before you ever called on the name of Jesus, our perfect and faithful father had already sent him on his way. What was his motivation? Great love. Then it goes on, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy. So the apostle Paul goes, but, but, because of his great love for us, God, our Father, who is rich in mercy. I'm gonna preach for a minute. I might get a little loud, but it's okay though. Roll with me, okay? I don't know if you're gonna enjoy this, but this is for me right now. But God, who's rich in mercy, do you know what that means? It means that the recession did not affect his mercy account. It means this that he's never asked for a loan on mercy. It means this, that he never, ever, ever runs out, that you and I can dip into his pool of mercy, and all we'll ever find is mercy upon mercy upon mercy because we have a merciful father. I don't know where you've been, I don't know what you've been through, but there's a father that is merciful, and he wants to lavish it on you. He is rich in mercy. Now, it's like it gets better. I can see the Apostle Paul. Now, I don't know how they danced back then, but I bet when he was having his scribe write, he was like, pause for a minute. <laughs> Look at verse five. What does this great love and mercy do? Makes us alive with Christ the very resurrection life of Jesus that he walked out of the tomb with, now walks and resides in you. Even when we're dead in our transgressions, it is by grace 
you've been saved. The word saved means to be rescued. Rescued from what? Spiritual death, separation from God's family. Now you're rescued and bought in. But not only are you forgiven, but you're given great love. You're given great mercy. And you're given the very life of Jesus as our life. Grace simply means this, that Jesus does for us what we could never do. For 33 years, Jesus perfectly lived the Ten Commandments because we couldn't. It, it, was, it, was, it was like Jesus took the ACT for us. <laughs> and God the Father goes, Jesus scored perfect, I give it to you as a gift. And you and I go, that's not fair. And he goes, I know, that's why it's called grace. He dies the death we should have died on the cross. And he raises again to new life to give us his life. This Father's Day, will you let our perfect Father love you with his redeeming love? With his redeeming love. And this is, a, this is becoming one of my favorite theological words. Now when you think of redeeming, maybe you think of a coupon, you go in, you get like 20% off or whatever. No, 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 this word is rooted in the story of the nation of Israel during a period called the Exodus. So if, if you would go with me on a journey, you'll see where we're going, okay? So put on your seatbelt, roll with me, trust me on this, okay? So a couple thousand years ago, um, there was a father, he had a bunch of sons, one of them was named Joseph, he gave Joseph uh, a Giorgio Armani coat. <laughs> he gave him a real nice coat, the other brothers didn't like it. So what, what they basically did was beat Joseph up, told his daddy Joseph was dead, put him in a hole, then sold him into slavery into Egypt. He's about 17, maybe 13. Very, very traumatic. He gets sold into slavery, and he ends up in Egypt in a man named Potiphar's house. I don't suggest you name your kids Potiphar, ladies, but just saying. If you want to, guys, it's cool. Potiphar was high up in Pharaoh's uh, organization. He was a leader in e Egypt. One day, after he's working, he's still loving God despite all of this hardship. And Potiphar's wife sees Joseph, and, he, and he's looking good. You know, he's 17, he's getting all buff, you know, Hebrew boy, the sun glistening all over him. And, and, and she, she, she was a cougar. She seen him, and she was like, <laughs> you know, and um, she made it, it, it advances at him, and he was like, nah, I love the Lord. He was Pentecostal. He was like, I love the Lord, and the Lord loves me, and I love Potiphar. I ain't messing with you. Okay. That's Hebrew. You got to look deep in the text for that. That's Hebrew. So anyway, she blames him and says he tried to assault her, rape her. So he gets sent to prison again, this poor guy's life. Anyway, while in prison, he continues to love the Lord. His leadership gives flourish. Make a long story short. He finds himself as second in command in all of Egypt. Well, the brothers thought he was dead. They were starving in the land of Canaan. So they go to Egypt because they hear there's this wise man there. Anyway, Joseph forgives them. He says, hey, go get my daddy. Bring all of the Hebrews to Egypt. Well, the Egyptians did not like goats. That's a good thing. Because they told the Hebrews like, hmm, Y'all stinky. Y'all go to the land of Goshen. Y'all get away from us. Get over there. And when they did, they started to grow and multiply and multiply and multiply. So you have a whole nation that is growing because of goats. Well, Joseph dies and there's a new pharaoh and he's like, who are all these people? Boy, they would make great slave labor because I need some new pyramids. Anyway, they get enslaved, things are really bad, and the Hebrew people could not fulfill the covenant for God, which was to show the world what life with God is like. God's people are always missionaries, but they couldn't do it because they were in prison, they were in shackled, they were oppressed. So God gets this guy named Moses who's a stutterer. Now, I can relate to Moses because I'm a stutterer too. By the way, it freaks me out that I get to preach and teach all of the world and I'm a stutterer, go figure. Anyway. So God tells Moses, he's like, Moses, I hear my people's cries, and I'm going to set them free from Pharaoh. And Moses is like, yeah, boy. <laughs> and then God says, and by the way, I'm going to use you to do it. And Moses is like, what you talking about, Lord? And like, I got you, trust me. Anyway, God brings a bunch of plagues. He gives Pharaoh mercy. 
And you know what hardens Pharaoh's heart? Mercy. The more mercy God gives you and you reject it, the harder your heart gets. So finally, God says, I've got to go to the extreme. I'm going to take the firstborn life of all the male children in Egypt. Now, you Hebrews, I want you to put the blood of a sacrificed animal on your door, and the angel of death is going to pass by. So the angel of death passed by. Firstborn dies. Pharaoh's like, you Hebrews, get out of here and leave. That's redemption. The nation of Israel were set free from the captivity of Pharaoh. Now, you're going, what in the world does that have to do with anything? Everything, and here's why. You and I are born in slavery to a greater Pharaoh called sin, death, and evil. Who in here has never sinned? We all have. By the way, in South Carolina, about 15 years ago, I met a man who told me he hadn't sinned in 10 years. I said, you just did, because you lied. <laughs> and then I said, and pride is a sin too. So in two seconds, you got two sins messed up 10 years. <laughs> I was like, is he serious right now? He was. So, so all of us know that we've sinned, and all of us, recognize that one out of one people die, everybody dies. And all of us have been touched by evil, have we not? You see, there's a great Pharaoh, but there's a greater deliverer. And his name is not Moses, his name is Jesus. Now watch this, watch redemption. Paul says, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have Power, on the count of three, say power. One, two, three. Power. Okay, now teenagers and young adults, under 30, back in the day, there used to be a show called Good Times. And there used to be, the star of the show's name was JJ. And JJ would walk into a room and he would go, dynamite. It, 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 was, it, was, it was really funny, because he was like seven foot tall and like 80 pounds. He would, he would say, dynamite. Well, that's the word dunamis, where we get the word power from. Well, God in his love wants to give you dynamite. You see, his redeeming love is a powerful love that sets us free. Now watch this. Together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and how long. So notice this, it makes a horizontal beam. Wide how wide and how long, now watch the next part, and how high and how deep. Y'all see, see that? Wide, long, high, and deep. What does that make? That makes a cross. To grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. This is what that means. It means this, that God's love is a powerful love that sets us free. So I don't know what you are going through. Maybe you're in the clutches of addiction. Maybe your marriage is hanging on by a dental floss. Maybe it's self-esteem issues. I don't know what it is, but I do know this. Whatever is enslaving you cannot withstand the power of God's redeeming love. Whatever has your heart afraid cannot withstand the power of God's redeeming love. Whatever is robbing you of joy cannot withstand the power of God's redeeming love. Would you let the Father redeem you? So yesterday morning, I'm marinating at the Starbucks, getting ready to preach and teach. And uh, Dr. Daniel Amen has become uh, just a wonderful friend. He, he, he wrote the Daniel plan with Pastor Rick and another author. So he came to hang out with, with me at Starbucks. He, he also came for our mental health weekend to preach and teach at Transformation Church. If you get a chance to see it, we have a wonderful conversation back and forth. You can go to our website at transformationchurch.tc and you can see it. Well, so Dr. Amons became my bud and, and, and so we're, we're marinating and he tells me, he says, uh, Derwin, people who have purpose live 15% longer than people who don't. And then he said, 
Purpose is an antidepressant. And then I said, I'm still in that and going to preach that. And then he said, word. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> he was like, awesome. So purpose is important, and, and, and the Father's love wants to give us that. So check this out. Will you let God the Father's love repurpose your life for his glory? Would you let him repurpose your life for his glory? Now let's look at verse 20. Now to him who is able. I want us to marinate for a moment. Now to him who is able, that, that God is able. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Think about this, guys. God is able to do more than all we can ask or imagine. If somebody would have told eight-year-old Dewey Gray at Ira Ogden Elementary on the west side of San Antonio, Texas, when I had to be in speech therapy classes, that one day me and my daughter would be preaching in Calcutta, India, in the Calpar slums in 100-degree um, weather with hundreds of people on the ground listening to the, to the word of God. And after the invitation to receive Christ went forth, people were running to the stages with their babies. People were weeping and crying. We didn't speak the same language, but we did speak God's language, and that's the language of love. If somebody would have told me, hey, 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 uh, Dewey, now you scored a 16 on your ACT to barely get into college, but one day you're gonna have a doctorate. One day you're gonna write four books. I would have went, I don't even like to read books. If somebody would have said, hey, Dewey, the first wedding you went to was your own at 21 and you didn't even know what a marriage or wedding was and you've been married 24 years, I'd have said, you're crazy. If somebody would have said, hey, Dewey, when I was about 11 years old and I got cut from the Pee Wee League Pop Warner team, do you know how bad you gotta be to get cut from the Pee Wee League Pop Warner team? If somebody would have said, hey Dewey, don't worry about it, hang in there. God's gonna do exceedingly above and beyond whatever you think you can imagine. You're one day gonna be a team captain in the NFL. There's a lady at our church and about six years ago, she was like, Pastor, I'm gonna start praying that you meet Rick Warren. I'm like, how am I gonna meet Rick Warren? Hey, that's never gonna happen. I'm like, you just keep on praying. About a year and a half, two years go by, I'm preaching at a conference, and surfer man David Sean come, come, comes in. <laughs> hey, Derwin, Rick Warren wants to talk to you. I was like, Rick Warren? Rick Warren, ah! Then I was like, hello, Pastor Rick, how are you? <laughs> on the inside, I'm like, it's Rick Warren, it's Rick Warren. <laughs> so here's my point. Here's my, here's my point, and particularly if you're under 25, here's my point. There's a God who wants to blow your everlasting mind. There's a God who wants to do something in you that is so great, so phenomenal that you look up and look in the mirror and go, I gotta pinch myself because I would have never ever thought I would do and be who I am. That's the God who is now unto him who is able to do exceedingly above all that we can think or imagine. That's the God we serve. Now, now, I used to not believe that the 40-something-year-old midlife crisis thing, I thought that thing was like not real. I'm learning, I didn't know a lot of stuff that I thought I knew. This thing is real, man. Like your kids start graduating. I'm like, what's happening? I mean, you feel like you're on a surfboard and I don't even know how to swim. But I feel like a lot of times in life, I'm like, on a surfboard. And you know what happens? You get to be about my age, and it's like, so is this it? If you're in that place and you feel like, I'm finding myself in a story that I don't particularly like, I got some good news. It's only a semicolon. God is still writing. He's a great editor. He's not done with you. He ain't even finished. If you got breath in your lungs, he's still the God who does exceedingly above all we think or imagine. 
How does he do it? According to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory. You know what glory means? Glory simply means this. God, I want my life to be a spotlight that says how great you are. And he provides the power to do it. He wants to repurpose us. And Jesus said it best. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbors, you love yourself. The way we say it at Transformation Church is upward, inward, outward. I can't love my neighbor if I don't love myself. I can't love myself if I don't love God. So it makes a cross, upward. God loves us, we love him back. We begin to love ourselves, which breeds humility. We realize our significance and value and worth is found in Christ and what he's done, not what we do. And then that moves us to love our neighbors. That's your purpose. Now, how do you express your purpose? That's called your vocation, your calling. So listen, if you're a tattoo artist, love God, love yourself, love your neighbor. If you're a pilot, love God, love yourself, love your neighbor. If you are a teacher, love God, love yourself, love your neighbor. If you're a neuroscientist, love God, love yourself, love your neighbor. If you're a lawyer, a politician, a janitor, a CEO, whatever it is you do, whatever God puts in your hands to do, you love him, you love yourself, and you love your neighbor, and let his repurposing love transform this world in you and through you. So, I got things I used to do with my son, and daughter, and one of the things I used to do with my son is when I would get home from trips, I would get down on one knee, and I would say, big bull, because ever since the kid was born, he was just big. So right now, he just finished ninth grade, he's 6'1", 187, like he dwarfs me. He's five times the athlete that I ever thought I, I could be, it's un, unreal. Anyway, when he was small, I would say big bull, he would say daddy's home, then he would sprint into my arms and I'd grab him, hold him and kiss him and say, son, I love you. I'm forever for you. There's nothing you can ever do to make me stop loving you because you are my son. Now, if I did that today, he would literally hurt me. <laughs> well, on August 2nd, 1997, I realized that when Jesus hung on the cross, it was God the Father saying, Derwin, run into your father's arms. And on this Father's Day weekend, God the Father saying, run into my arms so that I can love you with a love that you didn't even know was possible. Here's our soul tattoo. It's our big idea, our take home. Stop trying and start trusting your faithful and perfect Father. Stop trying and start trusting. Trying is God, I'm going to do this. Trusting is, God, Jesus has done it, and I receive it. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you so much for your mercy. Thank you on this Father's Day that we can celebrate you, the faithful and perfect Father that loves us with a love that regenerates us, makes us alive, loves us with a love that sets us free and repurposes our life. I pray that our hearts are strengthened. I pray that our resolve is strengthened, that our faith is increased. I pray that the restless heart would find rest. I pray that broken hearts would be mended. I pray that we would be comforted. I pray that your peace would be upon us like a warm coat on a cold night. And I pray that your love would burn deeply in the depths of who we are. Touch the hurting, Lord. Heal scars and turn them into memorials of your healing. Right now in this moment, maybe you're saying, hey, Pastor Derwin, I wanna know God's love the way you described. I, I want to be made alive. I want to be set free. I want to be repurposed. I want to be forgiven. I want all those things that you said Jesus could do. I'm, I'm ready to follow him. If that's you, if you feel God knocking on the doors of your heart, would you let him in? Would you let his son in? In the silence of your heart, just, just say this to him. 
Lord Jesus, today, I choose you. I choose your Father's love that you express so beautifully. Today, I choose to be made alive by your resurrection. Today, I choose forgiveness by your work on the cross. Today, I choose the power of your redemption through your life in me. Today, I choose your daddy to be mine. Thank you, Lord Jesus, and I will follow you all the days of my life. Thank you for holding me near. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jay Cranda, the online pastor here at Saddleback Church. We're so glad you joined us to watch this message today. At Saddleback, we believe that life is better together. That's why we want you to get connected to our church family, whether in person or online. We have campuses all over Southern California and on four continents all around the world that would love to welcome you to their weekend services. You can find a campus near you at saddleback.com slash locations. And if you're not able to attend a campus in person, don't worry. We have an online community designed just for you. You'll have an opportunity to connect with the messages each week and find resources to help you grow your faith. Thanks again for watching, and we look forward to welcoming you into our church family.